If you haven't done so yet, make sure you pause the video and try to answer the question on your own first before listening on. For part A, we can represent the car as just a single point and then draw the basic forces that are acting on that point. And of course, we have the downward gravitational force that we can label mg. And then we have the upward normal force, which is basically the ground pushing up on the car. And then as the car slides to the left in this diagram, there is going to be a kinetic frictional force that's pointing to the right and acting to slow down the car and eventually bring it to rest. So we can label that FK. Now, Newton tells us that the net force that's acting on the car has to equal its mass times the acceleration. We can see that the normal force and the gravitational force are going to cancel each other out. In other words, they are equal in magnitude. And we know that because the car is certainly not accelerating in the upward or downward direction. So that means the normal force in mg must be equal but oppositely directed. So in other words, the net force acting on the car is going to be the kinetic frictional force. And we know kinetic frictional force is equal to a coefficient of kinetic friction times a normal force. And as just stated, the normal force is equal in magnitude to the gravitational force. So we can plug in mg. And then we'll notice that the mass m appears on both sides, so we can divide it out. And then we come over here and we can say that the acceleration is equal to the coefficient times g. The question gives us the coefficient of kinetic friction. It's equal to 0.4, so we can plug that in. And then we multiply that by 9.8 meters per second squared. And when we work this out, we're going to get 3.92 meters per second squared. And so this is the correct answer to part A of the question. Now for part B, we have redrawn the car and some of the forces that are acting on the car. In fact, all the forces that are acting on the car. And let's just clarify those forces. So at the center of mass, which was marked by that little dot in the diagram, we have the downward acting gravitational force. In the rear wheel, we have the surface of the ground pushing up on both wheels. So there will be two normal forces acting on those rear wheels. We've only drawn one vector, but we've labeled it as two times the normal force of the rear wheels because there are actually two of those normal forces. And then the same idea in the front. We have the surface of the ground pushing up on both front wheels. So we've labeled forces of two times the normal force of the front. And then finally, we have the kinetic frictional force, which we've stated is pointing to the right and is acting to slow the car down. Now, the question tells us that the car is in rotational equilibrium. And what that means is that the net torque acting on the car is going to equal zero. We can select the center of mass of the car as our pivot. So right here in this diagram, we can mark it and label it as the pivot. And since the gravitational force is passing through the pivot, it will actually not produce any torque. So we can actually disregard mg for the torque, but then we have these other sets of forces that we do need to consider. Let's begin with the two rear normal forces. And we do recall that for torque, we have to take a distance and multiply it by the force. Now that distance, which is labeled r perpendicular, is a perpendicular distance from the rotational axis to an extended line that runs through the force. So for example, if we look at this force vector over here, we can see if we extended the force with a little dotted line and then measured a perpendicular distance to the pivot, and we say a perpendicular distance because this forms a nice 90 degree angle, we can see that our perpendicular is going to be this distance right here. Now back in the original diagram, that would be this distance, which we can see is L minus D. So we're going to plug in L minus D for the R perpendicular of this rear acting normal force, and then multiply it by the magnitude of that force. Remember, there are two of those normal forces, so we're actually saying 2 FNR. And we'll have to note whether this torque is positive or negative. If we imagine pushing up on the back of the car where this purple vector is pointing, we would see that that might cause the car to rotate in this direction about the pivot. That is the counterclockwise direction, which is considered positive torque. So we'll leave our torque with a positive sign. We go over here, and we have those two normal forces that are acting on the front tires. Again, we want to extend a line through that force and then measure a perpendicular distance to the pivot. Well, that would simply be the distance that in the original diagram is marked as D. 
And so we're going to have D multiplied by those two front acting normal forces. And we can see that if we push up on the car in the front section of it, that would cause the car to rotate in a counterclockwise direction about this pivot. And that is indeed a negative torque. And then we get to this frictional force and we can draw a line that extends through it and then measure a perpendicular distance to the pivot. And that distance is simply the height that is marked H in the car. And so we're gonna have H times that kinetic frictional force. And it's a little tricky to see whether that would be positive or negative torque. Maybe one way of doing that is to imagine that this force right here that's pointing to the right is attached to the pivot by an imaginary rod. And if we pushed in the direction of FK, that would cause the car to sort of rotate in this direction. And so that's going to be a positive torque. And then we set the sum of these torques equal to zero. Now, since the car is not accelerating in the y direction, we know that the sum of the forces in the y direction must also equal zero. And if we look back at the diagram we drew, there are a few forces that are acting in the y direction. We have the two rear acting normal forces. We have the two front acting normal forces. And then we have mg, which is pointing down in the y direction, so that'll be minus mg. And again, we can set this equal to zero. We can simplify this equation a little bit because we know the values of L and D. Those were given in the question to be 4.2 and 1.8. So let's plug those in for L and D here, and then the D as well here. And H also was given to us as 0.75, so we can plug that in here for H. Let's also not forget that the kinetic frictional force was equal to a coefficient of friction times the overall normal force. And we said the overall normal force was mass times G. So that would mean the kinetic frictional force is 0.4 times the mass of the car. We know the car's weight is 11,000 newtons. So if we take 11,000 and divide it by 9.8, that would give us the mass. And then we multiply that by G, which is 9.8 course these 9.8s will cancel out we can calculate fk and it turns out to be 4400 newtons so we'll plug that in for fk over here over here for mg that's just the weight of the car so that's 11,000 so we'll plug that in for mg for the entire mg and then we can subtract the 4.2 and 1.8 over here let's take the second equation and perhaps we can solve it for the FNF, that is the normal force acting on the front wheel. So let's add 11,000 over to the other side and then divide everything by two. And then let's subtract FNR from both sides. We can take this expression for FNF and we could substitute it into the first equation. We'll clean the equation up a little bit next. We'll multiply these terms here, multiply the 2.4 by two. We'll distribute this two into the orange parentheses and then distribute the negative 1.8 in as well. And the rest is just a little bit of algebra combining like terms and so forth. When you solve for F and R, you should end up with approximately 1,964 newtons. So this would be the correct answer to part B. And now we can substitute this value of F and R into this equation to solve for part C. And when you do that, you should get about 3,000 536 newtons. So this is the correct answer to part C. And now for part D, the braking force on each rear wheel, that is just a kinetic frictional force acting on a rear wheel. So that's going to be the coefficient of kinetic friction multiplied by the normal force on one of the rear wheels. We know the coefficient is 0.4 and we already figured out F and R. And so when you work that out, that comes out to about 786 newtons. So this is the correct answer to part D of the question. And then similarly for part E, we want the kinetic frictional force or braking force on the front wheel. That's the coefficient of kinetic friction times the force that's acting on the front wheel, a normal force, I should say, that's acting on the front wheel, which we already figured out to be 3,536 newtons. And this works out to be about 1,414 newtons. So this is the correct answer. To